Now we have Ed Scouten, who's working on Cloud ABI, a way to make this a lot more easier by building a sandboxing-friendly POSIX runtime environment. Please give him a warm round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. It does, oh, yeah, it works. Yeah, good. So it's actually nice to see like, such a full room over here. There's only like 10 or 20 spare seats left. The last time I gave this talk in Germany was back at uh, Foscon, which was in September, I think, a uh, conference that's uh, in a place close to Bonn. And what was a bit um, of a shame was that they planned my talk right at the end of the first day, right at around the time that they started firing up the barbecue, <laughs> which, which meant that like, I only had 10 or 20 people attending my talk. So it's really the opposite experience of what I'm having over here. So I'm, I'm oh, wait, my laptop turned itself off. Now it works again, yeah? So um, before I start this talk, let me first uh, sort of introduce myself quickly. Um, my name's Ed Schouten. I'm an open source hacker from the Netherlands. Um, back in 2002, 2000, yeah, 2002, when I started studying, I became really interested in how open source operating systems worked. Before that, I was still a Windows user, but then I started using Linux. And um, a year or two years later, I also started using FreeBSD. I used OpenBSD for some time. Most of these sort of uh, commonly used open source operating systems, I've even uh, tried running them once. Um, some of them I liked a lot, some of them I didn't really like, but the ones that sort of stuck with most is uh, FreeBSD, as you can see in my t-shirt, and um, um, I also use Linux on a day-to-day -day basis as well. Um, so back, or late last year, I um, actually uh, lived in Germany and I had um, my day job where I did a lot of soft working over there. But there was something that um, really sort of uh, caused an itch that, wasn't, that I couldn't scratch, um, that I couldn't sort of fulfill at my uh, previous employer, which is the reason why I left and decided to start my own small-scale small um, IT consulting company called Nuxi, which is just Unix with byte ordering issues. So uh, enough about me. Let's talk about Cloud ABI, which is what I've been developing uh, for the last year. Uh, before I'm going to explain what Cloud ABI is, I'm first going to explain what I think is wrong with Unix. And lots of people have different opinions about what's wrong with Unix. So, you know, this is probably just bike shedding, trolling. Uh, you know, we'll see at the end of the talk during the Q&A whether you people agree or not. So, even though Unix is an awesome operating system that I've used for more than a decade now, um, there are like two issues that, that have never really been solved in my opinion. So the first of all is that the system itself doesn't really stimulate you to run software in a secure fashion. And what I mean with that, I'll explain in a minute. And it also doesn't really stimulate you to write reusable and testable software, which I'll explain afterwards. So let's look at a, like a very simple use case. Say you have like a Linux server running somewhere, and you want to run a web server on it. It could be Apache, it could be Nginx, it doesn't really matter, just some web server. This web server only needs to do like a handful uh, number of things, just a really tiny number of things if you really think about it. So it needs to accept incoming TCP connections on which it will receive HTTP GET requests and you know, somehow process them. Maybe it needs to access some files on disk stored in some kind of directory. Maybe if there's like a, some kind of, um, you know, for example, a Python or a PHP script in there that connects with some kind of database backend, it also needs to open a connection to that and then perform some transactions computer responds and send that back across the TCP connection. So this is just really, if, if you sort of look at all of the possible things that a Unix program could do, this is just a really tiny uh, uh, amount of functionality. But what you see is once such a program is compromised, an attacker can basically just do anything that that user uh, can do that the web server is running as, which is quite a lot of stuff. So first of all, it could just create a, like a tarball of all the world-readable data under slash, and you know, if your file system permissions are set up um, in a correct way, then this might not be, uh, not be really damaging, but you know, getting them set up for your entire file system correctly is in practice pretty hard. And also what is world readable within your company might actually not be world readable like, uh, for attackers on the other side of the internet. So there are also some other nasty things that an uh, attacker can do. So for example, it can still invoke set UID utilities that are provide quite a large attack surface. So exploits in those programs can be, of course, um, you know, used by an attacker to gain even more privileges. And even if that's not the case, an attacker can still do some really nasty things. So 
say an attacker would manage to break into the web server, install some kind of uh, you know um, uh, back connect service where it can you know create login sessions on that system, even if you would just update your web server to a version that's no longer vulnerable to a certain exploit, an attacker could have just registered a cron job as that user and just spawn it up every couple of minutes and be back in again. And even if all of those kinds of things, you know, accessing the file system is, you know, really well fenced off, an attacker can still turn the system into a botnet node, you know, and take part in sin flooding attacks, sending spam, that kind of stuff. So there's a huge disparity between what a program on Unix um, should be able to do and what it can do, because that's just how simple the Unix uh, security model works. And um, uh, you see that over time, um, people have introduced a, sort of frameworks and new features to the kernel to sort of uh, uh, make it a lot better. And um, in my opinion, you can sort of divide them in two different categories. And the first one of them is based uh, is um, adding more access controls to the system. So the, the mindset being traditional Unix permissions are sort of not granular enough, not precise enough, they cannot be expressed to, um, um, cannot be used to express the actual restrictions that need to be placed on a web server, for example. So we're going to extend that. And um, um, on Linux, you see that one of those frameworks is SE Linux, but another one is AppArmor. And AppArmor allows you to create security policies for every application. You can create a, a, a sort of an additional separate security policy that's, somewhere, that's so, uh, stored somewhere in slash EDC. And that can be used to sort of restrict the application even further. But in my opinion, that's not a real solution to the problem. Because what happens is that you know, a software engineer just uh, develops some kind of web server, releases it, you know, throws the code over the fence to the people uh, at the distributions. And they are the people that have to write these um, 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 security policies. And they actually don't have, sort of have the, like, the full understanding of how the application works. And um, in some cases, um, end users might actually need to modify these policies to get their application to work correctly. And I think that this is sort of not how it should be. It, it makes security a lot harder than it actually needs to be. And um, the problem is that, for example, um, uh, going back to our web server example again, if you would change, for example, the root directory of your web server in, in your configuration file, you also need to update it in your app armor security policy. Well, what happens is that uh, some user tries to do this, and for some reason it doesn't work anymore because he forgot to update the security policy. So then he Googles around a bit, and then he just sees, like, you know, this is caused by AppArmor. I had the same thing on my Ubuntu system. So what does the user do? App get remove AppArmor. Problem solved. <laughs> so <laughs> in, in my opinion, these kind of systems are, they, they, they simply don't work right. And then there's a second class of systems, and, um, you know, I've, over here I've called them capabilities based, but they're not necessarily capabilities based. But, you know, just for the sake of the argument, let's just, you know, throw a seccomp on Linux and Capsicum just in one big bucket. I'm now going to explain how, how Capsicum works in a bit more detail because, um, as you'll see, what we, we need to this knowledge later on. Uh, what happens with Capsicum is that you just uh, create your web server, like your Apache server or your Nginx. It starts up like a regular Unix process, and the first thing that it does is it parses the configuration files, and the configuration files, they list, for example, the IP addresses that the system needs to, to listen on, um, the, the path names of all the root directories, and it, um, it, it sort of opens up all of those directories and all of those network connections that it actually needs. Then when that part is finished, it calls a system, a special system call called a cap enter, and this sort of um, flags sort of an annotation bit in the kernel on that process to say that this process is, is now running in capabilities mode. That's how it's called. And what happens is that um, from that moment on, any sort of dangerous system call um, starts to return the error code enough capable. And to sort of explain what that means, so for example, that network socket that we opened because it was sort of uh, the IP address was, was mentioned in the configuration file. Of course, it's safe to call accept on that to accept incoming connections. You know, it's, um, when you get one of those connections, it's safe to call read and write on them to sort of interact with uh, the system on the other side. That's all safe. Um, it's also safe to open files underneath directories that you've opened. But what's not safe is you know, opening an arbitrary file on disk, saying open slash etc slash password and writing stuff into it, for example. This is really not allowed, of course. You know, just opening any files not allowed. And that's how Capsicum works. It turns the system into a system that uses capability-based security. And that basically means that there is no global state that a process has, but the process always sort of has a bag of capabilities uh, 
file descriptors in this case, that it can use to access resources on the system. And this is already used by quite a lot of applications on, on FreeBSD at least. So um, here you see Alyssa programs, the DHCP client, ping, TCP dump. Um, you know, TCP dump is, is a really good example if you think about it. The only thing that this program has to do is when it starts up, it has to open the Berkeley packet filter to capture uh, network traffic. It needs to make sure that it has, it has a file descriptor open to your terminal to actually write messages to it, you know, which packets were received. And when it has done that, it can safely call cap enter. And um, if an attacker somehow manages to you know, trigger a buffer overflow inside of TCP dump, there is little to no risk at all. And this is actually far more likely than you think, because TCP dump is full of all sorts of packet parsers. It can parse dozens, maybe hundreds of different network protocols, and all have sort of handwritten parsers to just uh, um, uh, find all of the specific interesting fields inside of all the packet headers. And there's a fair chance that there might be some buffer overflow in TCP dump. So what you can do as an attacker is you can just sort of send all this random traffic across the network and just r wait for a systems administrator to run TCP dump. And when that happens, you can actually just you know, trigger a buffer overflow in a process that's running as the root user on the system because everyone runs TCP dump as root. So um, th th this is a real good model for hardening all those, um, those Unix utilities, in my opinion. Um, I really like it. So, <clears throat> my experience is using Capsicum. Late last year, I started playing around with it, and it really works as advertised. You know, the, the implementation on FreeBSD is quite robust, and you know, the, the, the design behind it is all right, but there is something that I noticed that really makes it hard to sort of um, use this at a larger scale, something that's larger than just ping or TCP dump, because those utilities, they are fairly small if you sort of look at the, your average Unix system. So, my observation is the following. Code doesn't really like it if you suddenly start to disable functionality that it depends on. Code, so, so the best example that I could come up with, I'll, I'll first give you the best example that I ran into. There is this crypto library, uh, two crypto libraries even. I, I won't share the name, but what happens is that they try to open DevView random, and what do you do if that fails? Do you give an error message or do you terminate? Uh, no, not really. You actually just run get time of day and then get the, the user ID or something like that. And then just use that as your initial state for the random number generator because, you know, the, the, the time is random enough. So <laughs> that, that's actually pretty bad. So if you're not using Capsicum, this code is completely safe because opening dev view random always works. But as soon as you call cap enter, then it no longer works, and you go through a different code path that was sort of never exposed before on, on a regular Unix system, and you end up with this completely unsafe setup. Now, there's also some, some other um, annoying things that I ran into. So, for example, um, uh, time zones. Um, if your program starts up and you call cap enter and then run get time, uh, sorry, local time, it uses UTC as your time zone. The reason for it is it can no longer access EDC local time. Um, but if you call local time at least once before calling cap enter, it does use the local time zone. The same holds for localization. Once you call cap enter, you can no longer do any conversions of uh, pieces of text in different character sets. Um, you know, it's, it's just a real mess. So my observation is if you just uh, take like a really big Unix application like Apache or Nginx, and you put a cap enter call somewhere, you know, somewhere in main, then the, the program will just explode in sort of ways that are really hard to cure. You, 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 it's basically just, um, you know, you hacking on it for months just to get it working. There's no proper guided way of porting a larger application over. So what you see in practice is that um, smaller Unix applications in FreeBSD, for example, are being ported over. And um, um, sort of in-house maintained code, like for example, the code that runs in your Chrome tabs is being run in SecComp. But it's not as if um, most Unix applications make use of this. If you just run PS on your system, there's maybe only one or two processes on there that actually uses um, uh, Capsicum or SecComp BPF. So um, that, that's really what I sort of dislike about um, Capsicum and SecComp. Um, they work for these really sort of um, yeah. artificial or, well, self-developed use cases, but not for sort of the, the, um, the long tail of software. So um, a second problem that I um, have with Unix security is that it, Unix makes it really hard to just run untrusted programs directly on top of them. So if you just download a random ELF executable from the internet and run dot slash uh, run on it or however it's called, 
then you really mess up your system. Don't do this. I, I really wouldn't do this. Um, running it in jails, FreeBC jail, running it in Docker is a bit safer. Um, the Docker people are really convinced that Docker is safe enough to run arbitrary executables, but I, I guess most security experts really wouldn't dare this either. Uh, running it inside of a VM is, is safe. Well, also not always. I guess there's likely a talk, another talk at this conference that sort of uh, debunks the, uh, the, 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 the safety of systems like Xen or KVM, but it's safe enough for most people. And this really makes me wonder, why can't Unix just safely run third-party executables directly? Why do I first need to set up a VM, you know, spend an hour installing VMware, et cetera, or VirtualBox, putting a distro in there, and just to run the single executable? Why isn't there like a sane, simple environment that I can use to run these sandbox executables? So as I mentioned before, the, the, the second problem I have with Unix is um, regarding reusability and testability. And um, when I first wrote these slides, I had a really hard time coming up with the right way to sort of explain what I think is wrong with reusability and testability. So eventually I came up with a way of, of sort of coming up with an analogy. And instead of going, uh, looking at Unix, let's sort of make a step back and take a look at sort of software development in, gen in general, namely you know, programming. And let's just take a look at, at Java programming, for example. If you would write your simple web server in Java, you would probably write something like this. You'd start out with a class, class web server, and it has a constructor, and this constructor sets a couple of internal members. It initializes the class, and what does it do? It creates a TCP socket that runs on port 80, and it um, has some kind of root directory where your files are stored. Um, this works, but most people would agree with me that this is not the sort of the tidiest code you would write. If you would just write this for your uh, employer and send it out for code review, then hopefully one of your colleagues will just uh, you know come over to your desk and slap you in the face, <laughs> because because um, you know this web server is completely not flexible and reusable. Of course, I mean it, it always listens on port 80. It always uses the same directory. So what you do is you sort of um, um, extend the constructor make it possible to pass in a couple of extra parameters, namely a port number and a root directory. Um, this is already a step in the right direction, but then your sort of uh, veteran Java programmer uh, colleague comes to you and says, no, no, this is still wrong. You know, you need to use interfaces or come up with more nice abstractions and layers in your application to make it more easy to test. So most Java programmers would actually write something like this. Namely, instead of just creating your, like the TCP socket inside of the class, you just make it possible that a sort of an abstract socket type can be passed in. And the same thing holds for the file system access. Instead of putting all of that file system access logic inside of the web server class, you could also just create an interface that, for example, has a function um, get file content, and you pass in like a, a file name or something like that, and it just returns all the file contents in some kind of buffer. And what you can do now with this class is you can um, um, test the entire class without actually constructing a single networking socket through the operating system or accessing a single file on disk. This is something that you can test really easily. Now, if we take a Unix applications, uh, you know, I, I just showed you like three different ways of solving it. How, how, if you now look at Unix applications, you see that they always sort of stick to one of the first two examples that I showed. It's either the case that the behavior of the applications is hard-coded, or they, um, um, you know, they, they write stuff to hard-coded locations on disk, or assume certain you know, uh, uh, locations where they can access services. For example, Unix utilities, they all sort of somehow know that they can open var run name server caching daemon dot whatever to, to access like a name server caching. There's no actually way to sort of um, override this behavior really easily. So if they don't hard code that kind of behavior, it's typically stored in configuration files that are stored at the hard coded locations as well. And um, what you see is that applications always require the resources on behalf of you instead of having them passed in. So your web server configuration, you don't start up your web server and provide it the network sockets that it needs to use. Instead, you write in the configuration files on which IP address and port number it should listen. And this is really bad in my opinion because it doesn't allow you to sort of uh, um, uh, customize the behavior of the application. Say you want to use a TCP socket that has custom TCP timeout parameters or retransmission logic. Um, if you want to add support for this, you actually need to add it to the web server because when it parses the configuration file, the, there needs to be an extra configuration attribute in there that allows you to specify the, the, the parameters or any options, and those then need to be the, um, used to create the TCP socket. So 
the, the web server just builds up this huge baggage of all these configuration options that could have been um, sort of placed outside of the web server. There's no reason why they needed to be in there. So Unix doesn't use dependency injection, and I think that this is a double standard. We're really hammering towards having testable and reusable software, but apparently we don't care about this at the application level. So here's an example of a reusable and testable uh, web server. I won't spend too much time on this, but what happens is instead of just creating the TCP socket yourself, you could just assume that standard in it is a TCP socket, for example. And then you can just start up this web server in any way. So for example, it doesn't matter whether you use an IPv4 or an IPv6 socket, it still works. It can use TCP, SCTP, any kind of streaming protocol out there. It can listen on any address or port number. The fun thing is you can even create the socket once and spawn a whole bunch of web servers all using the same file descriptor. And then you've implemented concurrency without any additional effort. And this web server is, of course, testable because you can just use a Unix socket to inject requests and capture the responses again. So this is, a, in my opinion, sort of a better model than what we see in Unix right now. So now I've um, you know, spent a fair time introducing or explaining what I think is wrong with, cloud uh, with Unix, not Cloud ABI. Now I'm going to explain what Cloud ABI is. And you know, as you might have guessed, it's something that sort of attempts to solve this. So Cloud ABI is a new Unix-like runtime environment that um, uh, is, think of it as POSIX, the Unix standard, plus all of the stuff that's provided by Capsicum, minus all of the stuff that conflicts with Capsicum. So this makes it a lot easier to write software that works well with, with Capsicum. So if you would now write OpenDev Uranum, instead of just like making the program start up and fill at runtime, it now just fails to compile. And it's of course annoying if code doesn't compile, but it's a lot easier to fix you know, compilation bugs and then it is to sort of track down these issues caused by the security framework. Because what I explained before with the crypto library that it tried to open dev uh, uranum and then failed back to weak entropy, that's something that you really don't notice. The only way you can discover it is if you sort of trace the application and sort of take a look at the system call behavior and see what it does. That's how I, um, you know, uh, discover this issue. But if you remove all of these interfaces, then it becomes really obvious where sort of the, um, the, the problem points in your application are. It makes it a lot easier to make software run in such a sandbox environment. So what's also nice about such an environment is that um, applications can no longer just create arbitrary TCP sockets or something like that, or uh, open arbitrary files on disk. There are no more global namespaces, as they're called. And um, this makes it really hard to hard code all of that kind of stuff in the application. So it's sort of, um, you're, you're really forcing the application to be written in a testable way. And um, I, I think that's good. Um, it, it shouldn't be like this unconditionally because there's sort of, of, of course, a very large amount of legacy software, existing Unix software that needs to work. But it's not a bad idea to also next to that sort of have a clean slate Unix environment where um, testability and security is sort of a prime focus. And that's also like the po point here that I want to make at the bottom of the slide. Often when I give this talk at conferences, there are people that sort of walk up to the microphone and say like, this is nice, but it wouldn't work for, you know, traditional Unix use case X. That's of course really not what I'm focusing on. This is really a clean slate uh, approach. So just to sort of rehash what a Cloud ABI program can do by default, if you would just start up the simplest Cloud ABI process possible, it can still allocate memory, it can create pipes, it can create socket pairs, it can create shared memory. In other words, it can do IPC with itself. Um, it can also spawn threads and it can also spawn sub-processes. So it, it can fork uh, or, yeah, creating threads is not necessarily forking, but it, it can also fork. And it can also interact with some clocks. It can also even get random data from the kernel. Those are all things that are you know, really not harmful in any way. If you're just sort of a small, tiny program run, running on some kind of computer, there's really no harm in getting the time of day or getting some random data from the kernel. But what the programs cannot do is open arbitrary paths on disk, create network connections, and it can also not just send kill signals to other processes on the system. That's all really fenced off. So the simplest Cloud ABI program, if you would just run it with dot slash whatever, it wouldn't be able to do any harm on your system. <clears throat> so then you want to sort of uh, grant additional rights to this program to actually make it functional, and you do that in the form of file descriptors. So you make sure that your program is started up with the right set of file descriptors, and that's really <laughs> critical, just to make sure that 
you, know, you use the right set of file descriptors to start up your process. And um, what you can do is you can just use file descriptors to directories to access, access parts of the file system, which I've already mentioned. And this is really nice because in practice, this means that um, you know, most of you people are probably familiar with the change root system call in Unix, where you can lock up a process in a single directory. This is sort of change root on steroids. It allows you to create multiple change routes. Every file descriptor on its own is its own separate change root that you can access files underneath, so it's really powerful. Um, sockets uh, to make a program network accessible. What's also really nice is that Unix supports uh, file descriptor passing. Um, if you have a Unix socket, so it doesn't work for a TCP socket or anything, but just a local Unix socket, you can actually push in a file descriptor on one side of the, the, the socket and it sort of pops out on the other side. And this sort of allows for some really complex constructs where um, a program starts up, it doesn't have a lot of writes by default, but if it really needs a sort of a specific write later on, it can sort of send an RPC over to some kind of process like, hey, um, uh, I need to deliver this email for user X. Could you please give me a file descriptor to that person's mailbox? And that other process then sort of sends a file descriptor back to you and you can sort of write an email into it. So it, this, this is a really powerful construct. And um, also something that it supports is so-called process descriptors. As I mentioned in the previous slide, you can't just send kill signals to arbitrary processes. So what Capsicum did and what Cloud ABI also supports is process descriptors. Namely, there's a special fork call, and if you invoke that call, you actually get a file descriptor to the, to the child process. If you call close on that file descriptor, it automatically kills that child process. So there's also no way for you to sort of leave resources <coughs> behind. Um, it, it should be noted, it's important to mention, at a, some previous conference, someone made a sm smart remark. Yes, but what if you can pass process descriptors through Unix sockets? Because you could, for example, um, allow um, uh, a process descriptor to be passed to the child process itself, and then the child process can remain alive indefinitely. So that's not possible. Process descriptors are not possible through Unix sockets. That's, um, that's a restriction that's placed on this model. File descriptors also have permission bit masks, and they allow you to sort of really granularly turn off certain uh, privileges. So you could create a piece of shared memory, uh, a shared memory file descriptor, which is read writable for you, but then you duplicate the file descriptor, but on that second instance, you remove the write bits. And that file descriptor, you send it over to another process. And then that other process can only read from the shared memory space, and not write into it. So this is also an important concept. Without this file descriptor uh, permission bit mask, then the system would be a lot weaker than it is right now. So this secure web service, how would you model it in Cloud ABI? Well, it's, it's pretty straightforward for every sort of bullet point that I had in one of the previous slides, you just replace it by a, a file descriptor, essentially. So, uh, for example, you can use an AFINet or AFINet 6 uh, TCP socket for all the incoming HTTP requests. Uh, you can use a read-only file descriptor for the uh, directory containing all, all of the web root files. So it only has the read capabilities, but not write and not truncate, etc. So that means that an attacker can never actually modify, modify the files that are stored in your web server root directory. And you can also give this web server an append-only file descriptor that only has the write capability set to it, meaning that the only thing that an attacker can do in the worst case is append garbage to the log file. It cannot truncate the log file, it cannot overwrite its previous entries, it can only add more stuff to it, which, which is nice. So when I started hacking on this, I observed that Unix becomes really tiny, really small if you remove all of this legacy craft from it to begin with, but also all of the interfaces that are incompatible with the security model. So Cloud ABI only has 58 system calls, and, um, uh, which is pretty tiny. And uh, if you, especially if you compare it to Linux, for example, because Linux has 300 and FreeBees even has almost 400, I think. So um, it, it's a lot simpler to implement. And what this means is that you can add support for Cloud ABI to existing operating systems. So I started adding support for Cloud ABI to FreeBSD, and it only required me to write, I think, 6,000 lines of C code. And that is sort of enough support to run all of, the, sort of, uh, to run all of those Cloud ABI system calls. And now I'm also working on adding support to Linux and NetBSD. The NetBSD port is really robust because it's sort of similar in structure to FreeBSD. Linux requires some more work because sort of being able to um, run multiple binary interfaces is something that's not sort of uh, uh, a core concept of the Linux kernel, doesn't really support that, so I had to add some hooks to that. But that means that you only patch up the operating systems by adding a couple of uh, uh, thousand lines of code, and then you can um, uh, uh, run programs without recompiling them, which is pretty sweet in my opinion, especially for sort of cloud computing cases where you're just a hosting provider and want to run binaries that are provided by other people, this is sort of a real killer feature in my opinion. 
So now I'm going to um, uh, explain a couple more things. For example, how can you develop software for Cloud ABI? So first of all, cross-compiling in general is pretty hard. Um, this means that it's typically not that easy to build software for Cloud ABI out of the box. Um, and of course, I've been working on, on making this a lot smoother, and I'll explain how I've been uh, doing that in the, in the next couple of slides. But the problem is that um, uh, the tool chain so the entire tool chain for building Cloud ABI software depends on a lot of sort of uh, separate components. So there's a compiler, assembler, linker, then you need a standard C library, C++ library, exception handling library, math library. It's just a whole list and then you only have sort of the, the bare minimum of building Cloud ABI software. Um, setting that up is pretty time consuming, of course. And uh, in addition to that, you also need to patch up any pieces of software that you want to use. So, uh, removal of all of this capability unaware APIs really breaks the build in a couple of places. And at the same time, I'm also trying to cut down on sort of some non-Unix extensions that um, um, are either obsolete or don't make a lot of sense where the C standard has already caught up and uh, provide interface that are a lot nicer. And also really annoying some build infrastructure like AutoConf doesn't even support Cloud ABI to begin with. It, it does now, but that means if you have any source tarball from before March 2015, if you run dot slash configure on it and want to cross compile something for Cloud ABI, it will simply say, I don't know this operating system. So that's a bit annoying. So to, to mitigate this, I've been working on something called the Cloud ABI ports collection. And what it is, it's just a collection of build scripts that allow you to build um, a whole bunch of open source libraries. And libraries include Boost, which is really nice if you're into C++ programming, Curl, if you want to do some HTTP access, um, glib, which is part of a lot of um, sort of GNOME desktop-centric applications. There's even crypto, LibreSSL, and also I've been started working on some scripting language support, uh, Lua in this case. I'm working on Python in the meantime, which is going to be a lot more exciting, of course. Uh, but what's nice about Cloud ABI ports is that it builds those packages once. I build them on my Linux workstation or my FreeBSD server. And then it turns them into a bunch of native packages for different operating systems. So it automatically generates FreeBSD packages, Debian packages, et cetera. So what you, as an end user, only need to do is you, you can just go to uh, like my website. I'm going to give you the link at the, the very end of this talk. And it has some instructions on how you can add a couple of lines to your etc app sources.list or your FreeBSD package configuration. And then you can just use app get or pkg to fetch those packages. And they're identical across operating system. They're like byte for byte identical. And this means that you have a really consistent development environment on, like that you can use to develop software. So it doesn't matter if you're compiling an application or Linux or BSD. In theory, unfortunately not in practice, um, the, the, the checksums of the binary should be identical, which is really nice in the heterogeneous development environment. Um, I won't explain why the, the binaries aren't exactly identical, but it's, uh, if, if someone wants to grab a beer with me, I can explain it. It's horrible. So um, to, to clarify, these packages don't contain any native build tools. These packages are all built on my FreeBSD or Linux system, and they don't have any cross-compiler that you can run on OpenBSD. These are just the cross-compiled libraries. And the, uh, the goal is that sort of the, the, the actual native tooling needs to be provided by your own operating system vendor yourself. So if you're a package maintainer for some kind of distro operating system, you know, I'd love to talk to you because I can only, always use Cloud ABI packages for more operating systems. So here's just a, like a real quick explanation of how you install such a cross-compiler tool chain on FreeBSD. Um, I've, I've picked FreeBSD here because um, the steps are a bit easier than, than on Linux, and I wanted to make it look pretty, of course. Um, <laughs> so on FreeBSD, you first just run this command package install Cloud ABI toolchain, which gives you a copy of the latest version of Clang and the latest version of binutils targeting Cloud ABI. And these packages are provided by FreeBSD themselves. Once you're done, you already have a compiler, but it can't compile anything because there's not a single Cloud ABI library installed on your system. So what you do is you just add a, a couple of snippets to uh, slash EDC, and then you can run package update followed by you know, this long package install command. And um, you know, what you see over here, this is the name of the architecture, x86, 64 Cloud ABI, and this is the name of the package, namely CXX runtime. So if you install this package, you get a C library, a standard C++ library, enough to do standard C and C++ hacking. And then once that's done, you can already just invoke the cross-compiler and compile any software you like, even including Hello World applications. So <clears throat> now that I've explained how you can sort of develop your Cloud ABI software, we're going to look at uh, uh, starting them up. And um, it's actually sort of more interesting than you think. There's more to it than meets the eye. Um, 
if we're going to take a look at a very simple Unix application, so um, LS, for example. Many people have used this application. I won't need to, need to explain what this tool does. It, anyway, uh, what we do is instead of just um, uh, uh, calling you know, open dir on dot or what LS does by default, it opens the current directory and fetches the directory entries. There's no way we can do this because the application has no working directory anymore. It's simply not there anymore in Cloud ABI. So we call FD open there, which allows us to open a directory by file descriptor. We then call read there on it in a loop and then just print all of uh, the, the, the file entries that are in there. Um, you also see that there is no standard out in this runtime environment. Um, you know, it's really just we need to assume that standard in, or sorry, standard out happens to correspond with file descriptor one. So that's what the FD open call is for. So how can we invoke this application? In a bit of a sort of a less traditional way, we first compile it, run it through the cross-compiler, then we load up a kernel module that's needed on FreeBSD to, to run this. Nice thing is this is already just integrated into FreeBSD 11 by default. So if you just download the latest development snapshot of FreeBSD, run KLD load Cloud ABI 64, it works out of the box. No packages needed, no patches needed, just works. Pretty awesome. And then when you have the binary, you can just run dot slash ls, but we need to provide it a file descriptor to a directory on, uh, on file descriptor zero. We just run dot slash ls smaller than slash edc, which works. It prints all of the entries in the directory. So this is like a Cloud ABI's Hello World application in a certain way, ls. So even though this works, this is not really a natural way of starting processes. It can really get out of hand. Starting up a web server with 20 different file descriptors to different TCP connections, etc., it really doesn't work. It's, the shell is not meant for that. Uh, even to make it worse, there's not a, a sane portable way in which you can create um, uh, network sockets through the shell, of course. And how do you know the ordering of the file descriptors? If you have a web server that uses 20 file descriptors, how can you be certain that file descriptor 13 was actually the one that corresponded with the network socket? Maybe that was the log file or it, it gets out of hand quickly, so please don't use Cloud ABI in this way. It's, it's a mess. Um, also, a problem with this approach is you really lo you, uh, sorry, lose the existing paradigm where you can specify complete applications through a single configuration file. Right now, you can just go to slash EDC, make changes to a configuration file, and restart the service, and it works. Um, if you would just start it from a shell, you would have maybe a separate configuration file with program attributes, but then you'd also need to start up the web server with all the different file descriptors. So it sort of uh, turns it into do, uh, sorry, two different ways of configuring the application, namely your, your sort of configuration attributes and file descriptors. So I've been thinking about a way to sort of streamline this process, to make it a lot easier and safer and saner to start processes. So I came up with a launcher tool called Cloud ABI-run, which is only a couple of lines of sorry, 100 or 200 lines of C code big, it's fairly tiny. And what it does, it sort of replaces traditional string command line arguments, so argv, by a tree structure that semantically looks a lot like YAML. And I'm just going to sort of explain in the next couple of slides for what it looks like, and then it sort of becomes more obvious how it works. So assume that you sort of have a traditional Unix process, so not a Cloud ABI process that has a YAML configuration file. You could, for example, have a schema that looks a bit like this. So you specify a host name that's returned in error messages or log file entries, a number of concurrent connections if it has some kind of thread pool inside of it, an IP, IP address and port number on which it needs to listen, a log file and a root directory. With Cloud ABI run, what you do is you sort of annotate this file in a special way Instead of just specifying these path names directly, like I did in this slide, or like those IP addresses over there, use a special tag. YAML's apparently a type language. I didn't really know this, bef uh, know this before I started working on this, but I've just created a couple of custom types, tags, that you can use to annotate which strings are actually path names and which strings are actually IP addresses on which you need to bind. So what happens is that Cloud ABI run parses this YAML file. It, it scans over all the entries in there. It sees all those socket and file tags and then just replaces them by the actual file descriptors to those uh, directories and um, uh, network socket addresses. So eventually you end up with something that looks like this, just like a pre-processing pass that gets rid of all of that stuff. And this is actually what's being passed on to the application. So if you're writing a program, instead of using int main, you can now use an alternative prototype called program main. And um, there is a set of functions provided by an, an arc data header. <coughs> 
And these allow you to sort of um, uh, traverse over this data structure, extract file descriptors from it, extract scalar values like integers and strings and booleans. Also allows you to sort of iterate over all the maps and uh, dictionaries and all the things that are stored in that YAML file. And um, this is like a sort of a really nice compromise in, in my opinion because it doesn't make it harder to configure services than the way it is right now. You still have a single configuration file that allows you to sort of both add configuration attributes but also resource dependencies that you want to list. And it also makes it impossible to sort of get the ordering of the file descriptors wrong, of course. And what's also really nice is that Cloud ABI Run also ensures that all file descriptors that happen to be open at the time but weren't specified inside of this uh, YAML configuration file are closed. So there's no longer any accidental leakage of file descriptors into processes. Uh, for software developers, it means that there's no longer a need to write configuration file parsers. You can just use this arc data structure to, uh, to, to sort of browse through all the configuration uh, parameters. And there's also no longer a need to sort of uh, write code to um, acquire all those resources and startup, which is nice. So once you're in program main, you can already start working instead of first having <laughs> tens of thousands of lines of parsing a configuration file and acquiring all the resources the way you need them. So now I'm quickly going, like in the last remaining minutes that I have, I'm going to explain some use cases for Cloud ABI that I've been thinking of. Maybe the audience can think of some other cool use cases, and I'd love to hear about that. So at one of my previous employers, I, um, I was working on some kind of network security <laughs> appliance, and one of the things uh, we had was a spam filter that was running on this. And this spam filter, we bought it from some kind of third-party vendor. I don't even know the name of that company anymore. But the problem is that this is just a Unix process that's just running on your hardware appliance. You know, it's just a third-party binary blob that you're running. And what if this application was implemented as a Cloud ABI program and was modeled in a really simple way where emails would be sent in on a pipe, for example, and the application would then just return a true or false response whether it was a spam email or not. That means that if there's some kind of buffer overflow in this uh, uh, spam filter, uh, 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 email spam filter uh, system, then there's <coughs> almost no impact to it. The attacker can just sort of uh, consume some more CPU cycles on your hardware appliance, but that's all it can eventually do. Or maybe falsely return that the email wasn't spam, but the question is whether that's a really bad thing. It's still better than just uh, you know, eventually maybe even becoming root on this uh, um, uh, hardware appliance. Same holds for network appliances. There's a lot of uh, research right now towards doing um, uh, packet filtering in user space. Um, for example, NetMap is one of those projects where you can really efficiently get network packets into user space and implement all of the firewall logic in user space and then send a message back to the kernel whether the packet should be accepted or rejected. Something like this could also be run as a cloud ABI application to just uh, make it a lot more secure. So high-level cluster management. This is also a really interesting one in my opinion. Cloud ABI applications have the property that the dependencies of them are sort of really known up front. It's not as if they start up and then acquire the resources themselves. You already know what they, they, they depend on. So for some kind of cluster management system, this would also be really nice. You have a couple of web front-end applications, a database backend, some uh, batch jobs, and all of those have their dependencies that you can sort of e express in a graph. And based on that graph, the cluster management system can start them up in the right order, ensure that they're sort of started up close to each other, so not that, for example, the database backend is started up in a data center in Japan, while the web front ends are started up in a data center here in Germany. You can really improve the locality if you, sort of all, if you know all that information up front. Um, it also makes migration of processes a bit easier because you actually know what the process depends on, so you know what you need to migrate to the other system as well. And uh, sort of this is really looking really far ahead, and you know the question is whether it's ever going to happen, of course, but still I, I like to dream about this. Um, there's this service called Amazon EC2, and Amazon EC2 is really nice in my opinion that you, you can just run arbitrary uh, Unix programs in the cloud. It doesn't really matter whether, which program language they're written in. You can just uh, create your own Linux VM and just uh, run an, a web server a service written in Rust or whatever you like. Google App Engine, on the other hand, is sort of a more managed system where you just build your own application, either Python, Java, or Go. You just throw it over the fence, and they start it up for you and automatically scale it up. And um, already, sort of, if a system goes down, it, they automatically start it up on a different system, so it's a lot more managed. And I think that Cloud ABI could be used to sort of combine the two of these, where you sort of had a more managed system 
where you don't actually care about individual Linux or Unix systems anymore, but it still allows you to just build programs in any programming language you like. So maybe we'll see something like this in the future appear. Would be pretty awesome. So this is all I have to say for now because we're sort of way out of time, I guess. Um, here are a couple of links that are interesting. So first of all, there's a link to my sort of consulting company's website, but on that uh, site you can also find documentation of how to use this. All of this is open source, so here at the bottom are a couple of links to my uh, GitHub page for my company. So the top link is the, the C library that you need to use for Cloud ABI, and the bottom one is the package collection. So if you browse through the package collection and you see that some kind of package is missing that you like, well then, um, if you're really into that stuff, then uh, you, know, you can always send me pull requests on GitHub. And there's also an IRC channel, Cloud ABI on EFNet. So if you'd like to lurk around, then that's the place you can go to. And that's all I have to say for now. Thanks for attending my talk. Thank you very much, Ed. Uh, if you have questions, please line up behind the four microphones we have here. Are there questions from IRC by now? No questions from IRC. No questions from IRC. We'll start with the microphone oh. in the front oh, left. OK, thank you for your talk. Um, one of the problems you mentioned was that um, a lot of primitives we use, um, for instance, in um, C libraries are uh, that you are dependent um, um, from a, a global state of the system, for, e for instance, uh, etc local time, but maybe um, etc resolve.conf or everything like that. So, uh, uh, so, sorry, could you repeat that question? Yeah. So, how do you solve this problem of uh, being dependent of a global state of the system in uh, etc or? Um, for instance, uh, it's the local time that you mentioned, or yeah. So, so, so that's a really good question. So, um, so, so first of all, I, I, I do realize that um, systems will always have global state in them, and trying to eliminate that is just f far too optimistic. But what I think is, if um, at the very sort of bottom, if you look at sort of the core primitives that are exported by the operating system, they should not be bound to any global state. Global state is easier to introduce than to eliminate. And um, if you have sort of an, an, an environment where there is global state, for example, there is a workstation that has a login session that has a menu bar at the top or something like that, it's always easier to introduce it in a programming user space than it is to sort of already let that trickle through through the core APIs of the operating system. Because that's the reason why we need virtualization. It's sort of really trickled into the APIs and now applications really depend on that global state. So I'm not saying we can eliminate it, but it, it, it shouldn't be part of the core APIs. Okay. Uh, did it answer your question? Yeah, so if, if you develop a, a, cloud, uh, a, a, API, um, a, cl a cloud API um, uh, application, how do you get the, the local time? Um, you have to pass manually the etsy local time in the file descriptors? Yeah, yeah okay. so for example, it could be the case that your um, uh, configuration file for your application has like a time zone colon Okay. Europe slash Amsterdam or Europe slash Berlin, et cetera. And then inside of your application, you use that time zone instead of being stuck to a global time zone that's specified in slash EDC. Okay, yeah. thank you. The microphone front right, please. Yes, over there. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, yes, I can hear you. So um, there, you mentioned you started with the clean slate. Um, it was definitely partial clean slate. Um, Cherry OS uh, is a Cambridge University project. They made their own custom risk architecture with a custom memory management unit which can protect a region of memory known as a capability. And then at, uh, they have a custom operating system and a custom programming language, which then every time they instantiate an object, it's coupled not with just information, but also authority, no. uh, uh, capabilities to perform some action on a resource. Um, and this actually gives you a uh, multiplicative uh, attack surface area reduction because at every abstraction layer of your program, you're reducing attack surface area. Um, yeah. This is uh, like kind of like halfway or partial way there. It definitely um, implements some capability, uh, object capability security, but not the full thing. So, so it's, it's, it's really awesome that you brought up uh, 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 Cherry. Um, so um, I, I actually know uh, the, the people working on Cherry pretty well. I'm cool. very uh, 
thoroughly involved in like, a, you know, I chat with at least a capsicum people once every couple of weeks, so I hear all that news coming in. And so the, what the Cherry people are doing is they're building a CPU that has capability registers built in. So instead of having operating system level capabilities where you have file descriptors acting as capabilities, you can actually say, um, you know, I here have a tiny piece of memory, a buffer where an application can write into, but now I'm removing the, the right bit from that piece of memory and passing that onto some other thread or coroutine inside of the process, if I understand it correctly. And I mean, it would be really awesome if like Cherry and Cloud ABI had children. That would be the most awesome thing ever. <laughs> Um, and it's, it's, it's really cool because um, um, may, maybe you know Brooks Davis, who's a FreeBSD developer as well. Actually, he, actually I, I work on Tahoe Laughs, which is a cryptographic capability system. Okay. Um, and it has a different security model that works over a network. So you're saying that Cloud ABI should have kids with that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, potentially. Um, okay. <laughs> well, we should chat afterwards. Uh, I just wanted to like mention that my different perspective on Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just, yeah. It's, it's really cool that you mentioned it because, I mean, just look it up. Cherry, it's also developed by the University of Cambridge. Really awesome project. Cool. Next question from the front left microphone followed by the front right microphone. Uh, front uh, rear left microphone. Okay. Rear left microphone. No, first, first the front left, then oh. the rear. <laughs> Me or? Okay. Oh. So uh, the question about time more a remark uh, than a question. So I don't know about your threat model, but actually providing the ability to read the time can be a dangerous because you know uh, clocks are uh, kind of unique in hardware hardware details, and it can be uh, used to identify the machine. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is also a really good remark. So I have to say that um, um, you know famous last words. Uh, even cloud ABI is not perfect. So, for example, the fact that you can access those clocks. And the, the reason that I have for this is the following. So, POSIX has already a nice standardized interface for dealing with um, directories as file descriptors. So, open at the system call that I mentioned during, in these slides, is actually part of POSIX 2008. And with that in mind, I can sort of think that there's a reasonable sort of way I can expect people to adopt this. The problem with clock APIs is it would be really awesome if there was also really a, a way where you can say, I want to pass in a fake clock to this application. This application is not running in 2015, but in the future or the, the past. Could even be useful for testing 2038 uh, compliance bugs, you know? But the problem is there's no sort of standardized API for this. So um, uh, right now, to sort of make the adoption go a lot faster and not sort of cause a lot of uh, bike shedding and trolling, <laughs> I decided to just stick to a subset of Unix, and unfortunately that doesn't uh, provide any way to um, inject custom random number generators or random clocks or that kind of stuff. Yeah, but, but it's a really good remark. Yeah. Thank you. The left rear microphone, please. Uh, well, how... <laughs> okay. <laughs> ah, there you are. Um, how does your capability-based uh, security model play with IPC, especially when there is no parent-child relation between the processes? Uh, sorry, could you repeat that question? Uh, okay. How does your um, capability-based security model play with inter-process communication, especially when there is no parent-child um, relation between the processes? Um, well, I, I mean, uh, uh, so now I'd need to bring up like a list of all the um, uh, individual requirements or, you know, axiomas that sort of uh, specify what a capability-based security system is. but. Um, there is a way of, if, I, if my interpretation of KBT-based security is correct, eventually what it boils down to is that every program on its own has its own bag of tokens that it holds onto, its own capabilities, in, in, in Cloud ABI's case, file descriptors. And every process can do a couple of things with those file descriptors. Namely, it can discard those file descriptors at free will. You can just close your own file descriptors. And you can actually pass them on to different processes. And there, there, there might be some other different requirements or some other properties in there as well. But um, uh, is this not a capability-based system? <laughs> That's my question. <laughs> What, what, what's what's uh, in your view missing? Can, can you use the capability-based security system to, to secure or to control inter-process communication? Um, well, uh, I, I think you're referring to the fact that um, with, there's also this thing that 
it might be possible to sort of um, uh, steal tokens from other process, where you can say, I now want to sort of disallow this process from accessing X. And there is no um, um, uh, support for that at all. So you start up a process and you granted these tokens, but there's no way to actually retract them later on. That's missing from this environment. But if you just make sure that you start your process up with the right set of file descriptors, where you don't leak in any things that the process shouldn't have access to, then I think you should already be quite safe. Okay, thanks. We have a question from IRC via our signal angel. Yeah. How is this in writes different from Docker, which is at the at its base also only TH root stereos? Uh, sorry, I didn't understand the question completely. You, you hear me? Okay. Yeah. How, it's, how is this rights management different from Docker, which is at its base also only th root and st steroids? Um, so, I, I have to confess there are a lot of different operating systems out there that all use capability based security in a different way. I think what, cloud what makes Cloud API unique is that, first of all, it's based on the POSIX APIs for which there's already a whole bunch of existing software available. And um, uh, compared to Capsicum, it has the advantage of sort of having less food shooting. So um, uh, yes, there might be some other systems that also sort of have a huge overlap in functionality with this, but sort of exactly focusing on making POSIX stuff work is actually where it's sort of the, the niche market is in this case. We have a question from the microphone front left. Most of the things uh, normally people today would do with namespaces, so user namespaces, um, network namespaces, or uh, boundary binds in containers like Docker does. Docker screws up only one thing, which are user namespaces, which are coming soon, since two years now. Yeah. And, and actually, the, the kernel hack uh, to introduce user namespaces into the kernel has to touch um, 150 pieces in the kernel, and one of our developers is working on this. Yeah. But it's not yet finished. So um, normally, I would say if I have a critical application, I would try to do it in a user with a different user and take away the rights uh, of this user. And this is very similar to to this uh, Docker kind of things of of, of uh, containerizing applications. Then I have all the um, all the things uh, that I do not even have to modify the application, which might be hard. So if, if you yeah. have, you, uh, you, men you mentioned Java, give me a Java binary which really accepts these file descriptors, then <laughs> everybody would be happy, but I've not seen it so far. Yeah, so, so um, I, I think there, there's sort of like a, um, a divide or like a, like a division that sort of uh, puts people into two camps right now. So first of all, there is this focus on uh, uh, switching towards capability-based systems, which I've explained in this talk. But then on the other hand, there's also sort of a movement that's moving towards virtualizing namespaces. So that includes both FreeBSD jails, but also Docker and the entire Linux namespacing uh, movement. So my concern with, um, uh, with the entire namespacing stuff that's going on in, in Linux and all of the other systems in general is that it actually removes transparency a lot. Because, for example, the, the user ID and user credential namespacing, how annoying is it that if you run, uh, for example, PS uh, on, on, on one system, you see that the process is running as user 1000, and then you just run PS in, inside of that container or that single namespace itself, and it turns out to be 1 million and free. It really removes transparency. Also, the, the worst thing that you could even come up with is PID, name, uh, uh, PID namespace virtualization, which is, in my opinion, not even needed if you think about it a bit more. Because then the problem becomes that like PID 75 in one environment is not PID 75 in another one. And it really puts the churn on systems administrators, in my opinion. And that's the reason why you know, this system tries to solve it by actually cutting off excess fat instead of adding more shrink wrap around it to sort of make all of the existing stuff work. The, uh, the, there, there's this overly strong mindset that for some reason there is no single way we can ever change any applications in user space. And I, I, th I think that's a true shame. Um, I, I think you know, times are changing. Unix is already, uh, what, 40 years old, 45 years old by now? Why can't it change? That's, 
that's really what I'm sort of trying to exper experiment with here. But, but, but it's some really good but remarks. It, but it's I mean. actually changing. So you, uh, if you um, port all these things into system D, then you only need to configure your system D properly, and every, uh, every pain goes away. And then yes, but, uh, but most people don't like system D, but yeah, yeah, they, they will exactly. be left behind. Yeah. Yeah, but, but, but I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a different solution to, to, to solving a similar problem. It's either by adding more shrink wrapping around it in the kernel, just you know, adding more and more virtualization or namespacing virtualization features in the kernel to work around the problem, or just uh, you're saying, like, we're going to remove stuff in user space that actually contradicts with this model. So it's, it's two different mindsets. Yeah. We have time for one very brief question from the front right microphone. Uh, what does this mean for uh, for scripting languages in the shell? Like, if I if I whip up a quick shell script for automating something in, in the file system, do I need to fiddle with the capabilities to get it right, or do, do I just run it all powerful and lose the advantages? So, um, um, uh, the Unix shell is something that um, is really something that's sort of orthogonal to what I'm developing over here, and. Uh, I'd be amazed if uh, you, we, you ever get to the point where you would just have a shell, a, a real, like a born like shell, a POSIX like shell where you can type in stuff that actually interacts with cloud API programs well. Um, for scripting languages, I think it, it's actually uh, uh, different. I mean, uh, I'm working towards uh, having Python ported over to this, and then you actually have a Python interpreter where you can just run all your standard Python scripts in there, as long as I don't try to open arbitrary files on disk. And Python actually already has nice interfaces for dealing with directory file descriptors, for example, in the latest versions of Python, that is. So um, it, it, it will break a lot of stuff. I'm, I'm, and that's why I'm saying it's going to be a symbiosis and not like an assimilation. It's really two separate environments, and we'll see where it goes. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Ed Skelton.